Well, good morning, everyone. You know, I'm not used to everybody just quiet again, watching the time clock tick in. You know, it's like everybody's wandering around getting ready, but it's so great to see you here this morning. Welcome to Palm Sunday. Are you ready to worship? It is great to be in the house, Lord. And welcome to those who are online as well. And uh, we're going to sing some songs of praise. For the first song, will you please stand with us as we glorify God and sing loud. Let's sing his, his praises. Praise is rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Well, see that again. When we see you, lift it up. It's when we see you, we find strength to face the day. i 
Yeah. You guys can go ahead and take a seat for just a moment. First of all, welcome to everyone who is here. Welcome to those joining with us online. My name is Josh. I'm the pastor here, and I am so excited to see you guys all here with us today. And as you can tell, today is going to be a little bit of a different day. We don't normally have very real palm trees on the stage and, and all of that stuff, but today is going to be an exciting day. Our pursuit kids and students are helping us lead the service today. Come on, be excited. You can even see right here we've got some different people singing with us. All of our teenagers like Scott and Carly are singing with us today. And so it's an exciting day. But before we uh, jump back into worship and into the exciting message we're going to have on this Palm Sunday, I want to encourage you to do a few things. Number one, there is a connection card sitting in the seat back in front of you. I would encourage you, whether you are new or old, uh, not old as in age, but old as even you've been here for a long time, I would encourage you to fill that thing out. If you have any prayer requests, anything that you would like us to know about you, please take the time to fill that out. And one specific thing, I want everybody to go ahead and grab the card because I want you to be looking at it real quick. Everybody just grab the card. Okay, on the back side of that, there's this long list of things. Scott, do you have one in your pocket? Okay, of course you don't. Um, so on the back side of that card, there should be one box that says, I would like more information about baptism or getting baptized. Is that one of the boxes on there? Okay, good. If you have never been baptized and you don't know what a baptize is even, I would encourage you to say, you know what, if I believe in Jesus and I trust him with my whole life, I, I've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to do something. Just check that box. Put your name on it, obviously, on the other side. Check that box. You're not locking yourself into anything for the rest of your life, which you could be, and it's an exciting thing, but you're not locking yourself into having to do anything. But, but if you've never been baptized, I want to be able to talk with you, have somebody here at the church be able to talk with you about what that means and why that's important. And all you got to do is fill it out, write your name, fill it out, put that in there, and leave it in your seat as you leave, or you can put it in the basket in the back of the room. Either way works. Second thing I want to remind you to do is continue to su uh, support Pursuit Church with your tithes and your offerings. If you're here in the room, there's a, bu uh, a basket in the back. If you're joining with us online or you're here in the room, there is always the website, PursuitChurch.life. You can make your easy, safe donation that way. But continue to make this a part of your life, a part of your worship, a part of your obedience to God in your life. And the third thing that I want to remind you of is this. Next week is a really important week. It is Easter, which is an exciting Sunday here and everywhere. We celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, and I want you to be here a part of it. But it's an especially exciting day for us here at Pursuit Church because we are going to celebrate it not just once, but twice, because next Sunday morning we are going to two services. That's right. We're going to have a 915 and a 1045 full Pursuit Kids Ministry for both Music, everything is going to be the exactly the same for both services. So if you're an early riser and you like to be home by brunch, guess what? This is your church because you can be here at 915, be home by 1030, and it's going to be a great rest of your day. If you're a person that likes to take an early nap, you're a 1045 napper, and you're thinking to yourself, I just can't go to church because i got to get that solid hour in at 1045. Guess what? This is your church because you can be a – okay. You, I could go on and on with a number of things, but we're going to stop there. But next Sunday, Easter Sunday, 915 or 1045 or both, if you just get really excited about praising Jesus. And there's a card sitting in your seat that says uh, you are invited to Easter at Pursuit Church. You are invited, but take that card with you and give it to somebody else and invite them to be a part of it as well. You do not want to miss it. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right, let's pray. And let's ask God to speak to us today. Let's ask God to maybe awaken something in us for him today that maybe we didn't even realize was there as we get into his word and as we learn together. Father, thank you so much. God, thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here. God, we don't want to take it for granted. And I pray that in the moments that we have left as we, as we sing, as we worship, as we open your word together, God, that you would speak to us, that you would help us to be able to hear you clearly, remove the distractions from our hearts and minds, and God, help us to be able to hear you and see you clearly today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stand with us, we're going to sing um, on this Palm Sunday. We're going to continue with this theme of Hosanna, so let's sing this together this morning. Amen. 
Here we go. Let's sing this together. Sing Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Let's lift it up. We're going to see, I see his love and mercy. I see his love. I see. Let's sing this out, sing Heal My Heart.
Sing this out, it's your breath. It's your breath. Sing this out, sing, you give life. Go sing this out and all the earth will shout your praise. as we think about this week and what this week is all about. We call it Holy Week and the week leading up to Easter from Palm Sunday. And we think about the, the price that Jesus paid for us and the love that Jesus had for us. So as we sing this song, this really old hymn together today, I want you to be reminded about the love and the grace and the mercy that was on display in the cross of Christ. Let's sing this together. Jesus 
Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. God, I pray that you would speak to us. God, that you would bring us near to you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. We're going to turn it over to the Pursuit students and the Pursuit kids at this point. Good morning. Friends, on this Palm Sunday, we invite you to join us on a journey, a journey where we ask the question, what would it have been like in Jerusalem on Holy Week? Not only that, but what would it have looked like if that week had been covered by modern media and told over the news? If there had been a Jerusalem news channel Perhaps the coverage would have gone something like this. All right, everybody, clear up. After Via Pizza Friday, Sissy and Dee Dee, everything's in a bowl, so just be ready for anything. So we'll catch that news as it develops. All right, let's go. We are on in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Prince, thanks for tuning in. Well, Dee Dee, it sure has been a busy weekend. Yes, it has, Sissy, and we have all the info you need to know. Residents are complaining about receiving a bad deal on purchasing area sheet. Our own correspondent, Peter Parker, will share with us why some think they had the wool pulled over their own eyes. Planning that special spring brunch, our own Sherry Powell has all the information you need to make it special. But first, let's look at the story that everyone has been talking about. That's right, Dee Dee. Jerusalem is in an uproar over the crucifixion of the Galilean known as Jesus. Many of our own co religious leaders claim that this has been a necessary punishment. However, some are complaining that this barbaric act took the life of a man who may have been their long-awaited Jewish Messiah. This will be the main story that we cover during this hour. We are going to take a break, and when we return, we are going to have one of the area religious leaders share his thoughts. Stay tuned. And we're off. Take care, guys. This part of our show is brought to you by Moody Mood Bibles, the Bible that changes color as your walk with the Lord changes. Cut the talk. Increase the walk with Moody Mood Bibles. Look, you two, I don't know what to think of all of this. All I know is that Jerusalem is in turmoil. There are a lot of people looking for answers right now. When this guy comes in here, grill him. I want to get to the bottom of the reason why these religious leaders were so against this Jesus. Understood, boss. 
But who is this guy? What was this guy? One of those that sold this whole thing up. I've seen him around. He was after the Caesar case the very beginning. Stay calm. when I pray applies much, much more. <laughs> Glad to have you. Okay, everyone, get ready. Places. We are live in five, four, three, two. <laughs> That's right. We are seated with famed Rabbi Victor, and we are going to ask him to give us some insight into the events surrounding the Jesus of Galilee. Thanks for joining us, Victor. My pleasure. But there's really no need to dwell on this Jesus, this man, this heretic. Let's focus on something much more positive. For instance, my new book coming out this month. <laughs> I think our viewers really want to focus on Jesus right now. It is my understanding that you have been concerned about his teachings for quite a while. Well, it is no secret that many of us have found his teachings to be offensive. He claims that he can forgive people's sins and <laughs> that the Old Testament prophecies <laughs> were about him. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Uh, <laughs> The people have been taken in by some of the signs he performed and missed the danger of his words. I understand what you are saying, but we have verifiable proof with us today that these signs were not tricks. How could he fake giving a blind sight, making a lame walk, or raising the dead? We are still analyzing all this information, but we are quite certain that the miracles performed were carefully staged hoaxes. Jesus stirred up trouble and confusion and led people from God's ways. Explain God's ways and how this man was obsessed. Certainly, although I am positive that your viewers would much rather hear about my album, Victor Sings About the Law. <laughs> Nobody? All right, God intends, as the scriptures say, for the people to obey his laws and offer sacrifices at the temple. It, as religious leaders, it is our job to help people understand and obey these laws. Jesus' teachings disregarded all of our hard work. Some have complained that the laws have become so complicated. They say the only ones that can know and obey it are the religious leaders. Absolute rubbish. We provide people with books like the one coming out this month and albums like the one dropping this week to help them understa understand the law. And where they fall short, we help them offer sacrifices at the temple. Speaking of sacrifices at the temple, Jesus seemed to capture the hearts of some of the public when he cleared the temple and drove out money changers. He was jealous and wanted our money. That seems a strange statement considering how much he gave to the poor and ministered among them. Have the religious leaders analyzed the prophecies such as the Messiah being born in Bethlehem, being a Galilean, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind? Have they considered if there is any validity to the claim that Jesus could be the Messiah? That's it! It's clear none of you want to hear the truth. We have longed for a Messiah who is a political leader who will deliver us from Rome. That is who is coming, not some servant leader. If this Jesus is truly the Messiah, then we've got it all wrong. Well, whether religious leaders like Victor are ready to admit it, the discussion about who Jesus is is far from over. We are going to take a break for commercial, and when we come back, we are going to interview two people who have claimed to be healed by Jesus. And by Christians Anonymous, where they only witness to other Christians. 
And the motto is, keep the faith to yourself. Now we have with us two people whose lives have been changed by the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we wanted to let them share their own stories and what their thoughts are on the death of Jesus. Matt was formerly blind and claimed that Jesus gave sight to his eyes. Charlene had major health issues that her doctor couldn't understand. She spent all her money on treatment, but claims that one touch from the hem of the robe of Jesus, and she was healed. Matt, tell us your story. Well, I know it's hard to believe, but I have been blind since birth. The religious leaders claimed it was because of the sin of my parents. My dad tried asking for forgiveness, but that didn't help. So I was on the streets asking for money when Jesus found me. He told me I was blind so that I could bring glory to God. Then he touched my eyes, and now all I know is I can see. What do you say to those who think Jesus was a con artist or serving the devil? He changed my life. Since then, all I want to do is praise God and read the scriptures. I don't think he was a con artist, and I know he's not the devil. What I experienced was a miracle. I am telling you, I was blind, but now I see. Who do you think he was? I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I believe he's the Messiah. As I read the scriptures, this isn't the end. Certainly strong words, Matt. Charlene, tell us your story. Hi, Dee Dee. Hi, Sissy. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I suffered for many, many years with complicated health issues. And I've been to doctor after doctor, and it seemed like just nobody could help me. I spent every dollar that I had, but I couldn't get any answers. I couldn't live a normal life. I couldn't even, I couldn't even worship in the temple. My life was cruelty. And then I heard that Jesus was in town. And I had also heard that he was a powerful healer. More powerful than any healer that had come before. And people said that there was something different about him. So... I left my house, and, and I sought Jesus out. I know he has always had a large crowd around him. How did you get through it? Well, that part wasn't easy. Um, I did take a few elbows to my stomach and even one to my face, and I was having trouble getting through. So I dropped down to my hands and knees as well. And I know it's really embarrassing, but um, I was so desperate that I crawled under legs, and when I got close enough to Jesus, he reached out my hand. And I didn't know what else to do. So I touched the hem of his robe. And what, what happened then? It was the strangest thing. Instantly, I felt different. I was healed. And somehow I just knew it. I couldn't believe it, and I was in shock. And I tried to get back out and find my way out of the crowd. But then he stopped, and he asked who had touched him. Well, of course, there were tons of people everywhere brushing up against him. But instantly, I knew that he was talking to me. Was he angry? No, not, not at all. When I stood up and told him it was me, he looked me in the eye. Like, like he knew. Like he knew that I had been suffering. And like he was pleased that I was healed. He loves me. And I know, I know that doesn't make any sense and I can't explain it. But he loves me. Not like a boyfriend or a husband. 
something much more, much bigger than that. Thanks for sharing, Charlene. Well, there you have it, two people impacted by the supposed miracle. We will return after this break. Hello? What, can you confirm that? Really? Yeah, thanks. Well, I just heard Trina say that there's really people alive out there now. I don't know if they were just dead, but dead or dead. We're alive in five, four, three, two, one. to JNC, your most trusted source of Jerusalem news. Thanks for tuning us. Thanks for tuning in. Joining us now is our station chief, Carrie Jameson, to share some of her thoughts on this weekend's event. This is a rare treat. We have gone to hear from you. We haven't gotten to hear from you since the olive oil shortage three years ago. Why don't you break it down for us, Carrie? Late Thursday evening and early Friday morning, we gained information that Jesus had been arrested by the chief priests and they were seeking the authority to have him executed. We know that there was a trial held and he was crucified. So ultimately, Jesus was sentenced to death by crucifixion and died on noon around Friday? Um, we have heard some of the events surrounding that death and we will certainly look further into it. But now I want us to go over to our newest field reporter, Nat Rami, who is with one of Jerusalem's 12 disciples, Jesus' 12 disciples. Friends, you were one of Jesus' disciples, correct? I was. I mean, I am. We are reporting that he was crucified. Can you share with us what you know? Yes, of course. We shared the Passover together, and after our milk, he told us he wouldn't be with us much longer. He said the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. We didn't understand what he meant, and we're afraid to ask. Now this? So, what does this mean? Jesus has died, but he will repent. He is Messiah, the Messiah. And the Son of God. You heard it here, folks. We will definitely continue our coverage. Back to you, Dee, Sister Dee. I think we leave our viewers with one question to consider before we sign off. You've heard the testimonies and seen the data that has been presented. How you move forward from here will be determined by this one thing Who is Jesus Christ? Thank you for tuning in to Jerusalem News Channel. This is GNC signing off. Who is Jesus Christ? He lived over 2,000 years ago. How could his life possibly matter now? To truly discover who Jesus is, we need to consider how he lived. The Bible tells us that when it was time to launch his ministry on earth, Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, began preaching that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. He was no ordinary teacher. He taught in a way that people had never seen or heard before. He taught with power and authority. In fact, people traveled from miles to be near him. And in a time before social media where there was Twitter and Life360, that was no small task. People left their families, their livelihoods. They left everything behind to follow him. They clung to his every word. They wanted to see what he would do next. And they wondered, was he the Messiah? It was clear that he was sent from God, fully God, yet fully man. We know this because he experienced hunger. He experienced thirst. He wept. He experienced pain of rejection and betrayal, yet he was without sin. And then there were the miracles. You heard a little bit about them this morning. Jesus exercised his divine power and authority 
over the forces of nature and humanity. At his command, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, and the lame could walk. He healed all types of diseases and sicknesses. He cast out demons. Thousands were fed with just a few loaves of bread and a handful of fish. He walked on water and calmed the raging seas. He even raised the dead. He was a miracle worker, but that wasn't the reason why he came. Who is Jesus Christ? To truly discover who he is, we also need to consider who he said he was. In John 3, I'm sorry, in John 6, 35, Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus says this not long after his miracle of feeding the 5,000. He states here that he is the necessity for life. Belief in him allows us to have eternal life, and we will never spiritually hunger or thirst again. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light illuminates darkness. Light can expose the darkness within us. We need light to see our path. It also provides warmth for things to grow. As the author of life, Jesus takes on all these definitions of light as the word made flesh. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. Here, Jesus is claiming to be the source of both. He does more than just give life. He is life. Believers in Jesus Christ will experience the resurrection because of the life that Jesus gives. And in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Here he's telling his disciples and us believers that he is the way to God. He is God. He is preparing eternity for us and will return to bring us to where he is. Friends, you see, the Bible is full of powerful passages like this where Jesus is declaring who he is. That truth, the truth of who Jesus is combined with his great love, it transformed people. Yet, not everyone who came into contact with Christ was changed. Have you ever wondered why that is? Did God lack the power to transform their lives? Of course not. God could only change those who received the good news and wanted to be changed. So I don't know if you guys know, but our family is from the great state of Texas. I don't know if there's any Texans out there. Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> um, so yes, we're from the Lone Star State uh, where everything is bigger, uh, the home of the Texas uh, Dallas Cowboys and Whataburger, my family's favorite. Uh, Dr. Pepper and Tex-Mex, doesn't get any better than that in Texas. Um, so Texans are taught from a young age in elementary school, Texas history. Um, we're also taught that there are only two types of people, people from Texas and people who wish they were from Texas. <laughs> um, so in fourth and seventh grade, I was taught Texas history, and there was one particular story that I learned as a young girl that stuck with me. And I want to share it with you this morning. It was about a holiday called Juneteenth. And it's highly possible that you've never heard of Juneteenth. It's a, ter it's a term of a blend of words, the wor June and then 19th. So Juneteenth. For many Americans, it's one of the most meaningful holidays on the calendar, and this is why. On June 19th, 1865, a Union general named General Gordon Grander arrived by ship in Galveston, Texas. He arrived 
to read an order called the Proclamation Order Number 3. This order was to inform the good people of Texas that per the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863, all enslaved people were free. The general and his men traveled from town to town, plantation to plantation to spread the news. They were shocked and saddened to discover that there were so many still living in bondage, so many still living under the yoke of oppression, not knowing the truth, not knowing that a victory had been made on their behalf, not knowing that they no longer had to suffer the daily hardship of intense labor any longer. They didn't know, friends, that the war was over and with it ended the brutal bondage that defined their lives. They were free from their shackles. They were free from their chains. Do you know at the time of their arrival in 1865, there were still 250,000 people living enslaved in Texas when the proclamation was declared valid two and a half years prior. People were still in slavery. There are so many stories of how these men would travel and shout it from the porches that the Civil War was over, that there was no more slavery. And they would shout after reading this order, did you not know that you were free? You are free. Men and women who were newly freed then began to run to their neighbors and to their um, neighboring plantations saying it's over. But why had we just found out? It's two and a half years later. But now finally, after Lincoln signed an executive order two and a half years ago, all enslaved people in the United States were free. Juneteenth is a holiday that teaches us something important about freedom. It's useless unless you know it's true and you live like it. Friends, do you know that you've been given a similar type of freedom? You and I have been given a spiritual freedom, and you may not even realize it. Freedom from sin and death. Freedom given to us from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord God, who came to this earth, who is the Messiah, who is our Savior. And will we make a decision to put our hope and our faith and our trust in him? Friends, we can experience a freedom like no other. John 8, 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. On Palm Sunday, Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem on a borrowed donkey. The crowd of people hailed and praised him as the king who came in the name of the Lord. As he rode into the temple, where he healed people, where he drove out the money changers and merchants. His followers had no idea of the suffering that he would endure on the cross on their behalf. But he did. Jesus knew. And he continued on anyway. He knew what was about to happen, and he knew it would result in the freedom of all God's people. Everyone sitting here in this room today he had us on his mind and the freedom that we would walk in, the freedom from sin and death. Friends, do you know that you're free? Free from the bondage of sin because of the sacrifice Jesus made on your behalf. We need to live free because we are free. What does it mean? To live free means to yield to Jesus to allow ourselves to be changed by him, to fully surrender to God and give him the permission to work within us. When we do that, we're making a decision to change our entire lives. I think the best way to answer the question, who is Jesus, is to tell you who Jesus is to me. Because sometimes the most powerful thing we can offer is our testimony. Amen? 
So my mom had me at 15 in a Catholic home for unwed mothers. She had me with every intention of giving me up for adoption. And I know this because when I would act up as a young child, she would tell me, if I knew you were going to be this much trouble, I would have given you up. She took me home, and I grew up in the housing authority, which is essentially the projects in lower Manhattan. My father was a drug addict who eventually chose drugs over me. And my mom had mental health issues, so she was physically and verbally abusive. We moved to Texas when I was eight, and she met remarried. Um, and when I was in my early teens, about 12 years old, I had an encounter with a living God. I had wonderful people like you come alongside me and speak God's love and truth into my life. And let me tell you, it changed me. It changed me from the inside out because I was a broken girl who felt unwanted, that encountered God's love, and it did something inside of me. I got the father that I always wanted, and his love healed my heart. That's who Jesus is to me. Do you know him? You know, friends, I don't know what you've been running from. I don't know who hurt you. I don't know who you lost too soon. I don't know what pain you're trying to forget. I don't know what addiction you are battling this morning. But I do know whose arms you need to run to. The one who can heal you from the inside out. The one who can give you beauty for your ashes. The only one who can give you purpose from your pain. Some of you have yet to run into the arms of Jesus and surrender to his perfect love. Some of you need to fall into his arms and allow his love and amazing grace to transform you. If that's you this morning, can I tell you something? Jesus is waiting. Jesus has been waiting for you. It's time. It's the reason he came 2,000 years ago. He came to set you free from the bondage of sin, not just your own sin, but the sin of the other people who hurt you in your life. It's time, friends, to know and live like you're free. Will you pray with me? Lord, you give life and life abundantly. We thank you, Father, for who you are and what you have done for us, Lord God. We thank you that we are free, free because of you. We are free to worship you. We are free from the bondage of sin and death. And that freedom, if we allow it to, Lord, we know that it can transform us. So, Lord God, I know there are people in this room this morning. Father God, I just pray that they surrender to a God who loves, a God who transforms and resurrects. Father God, we ask for strength in the storms that we're fighting this morning. We ask for courage for the challenges that we encounter every day. We ask for patience, Father, for all the pressures of life. Lord, we know that our, our struggles, our struggles are safe with you. When we don't understand, Father, we rest in the firm truth and knowledge that you do. You know where we are. You know what we're going through. You have overcome this world. And with you beside us, we can overcome anything that is in our path right now in the name of Jesus. We yield, Father, to the, your spirit working within us. Change us, Lord, as only you can from the inside out, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you for your sacrifice on our behalf. And it's in your son's name we pray. So real quick, before we go, can we just say a huge thank you to the Pursuit Kids and Students team and Melissa? Yeah, absolutely incredible. 
And I know that we're all up here today, but next week everything goes back to normal, right? No, it doesn't. Trick question. Uh, I want to remind you of a couple things. Number one, on Easter weekend, next weekend begins on Friday night. Good Friday, right here in this room, we are offering a, a time of reflection and prayer, a time to receive communion together as a family. You can come anytime between 7 and 8.30. You can receive communion together. You can sit and reflect and pray. Think about the cross and what it means. So I would encourage you to do that. Saturday, we have a exciting Easter fun day complete with egg hunt. I think we're up to like 300,000 eggs now that we're going to have out in the park. Something close to that. So that means you need to invite a lot of people to be a part of it. A lot. And uh, come out there at noon at Pratt Park. There's going to be free food. All you got to do is invite people and say, hey, yes. you get free lunch invite out of people. it, and, and they'll show up. So uh, be a big part of that. And then obviously on Sunday morning, we want to gather as many people here to hear about the resurrection, about Jesus and all he's done at 9, 15, and 10, 45. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right. Take those invite cards with you, and we'll see you guys back here next week. Have a great day. Have a blessed day, guys. <laughs>